Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Darcia Narvaez. She is a professor of psychology emerita at the University of Notre Dame. She has written on issues of character and moral development and her research explores question of, questions of species typical and species atypical development in terms of well-being, morality and sustainable wisdom. She, she examines our early life experience, the evolved nest, we're going to talk about that, influences moral functioning and well-being in children and adults. And her 2014 book, Neurobiology and the Development of Human Morality, won the 2015 William James Book Award from the APA and the 2017 Expanded Reason Award for research and we're going to focus on that book a lot today so dr narvaez welcome to the show it's a pleasure to everyone thank you so much i'm so glad to be here with you okay great so let's start perhaps with a basic question uh, how do you understand morality from a developmental psychological perspective all right. Well, thank you for that question. It's a big question, actually. I could speak about that for a long time because it's not very simple. So my focus is on behavior and being. So it's not what you say about yourself. It's not what you consciously think about yourself. It's how you are in the moment with others. So ideally, you're flexibly attuned to the other person, ready to uh, conduct a unique interpersonal dance with them. And you have a communal imagination that includes the web of life in how you behave in that moment. <clears throat> so that means when you meet a spider or an ant or a tree, you don't dismiss them as not, uh, this is very indigenous, <laughs> you, you include them in the web of life and your uh, sense of concern, empathic concern. So really my focus is on virtue in the moment. What orientation do you have? Are you oriented to being open or are you oriented to being bracing against the other and either hiding or dominating, right? Because that's our older subhuman part of our mind that gets enhanced when we don't get early nurturing care or we get traumatized. We'll easily go into that mode <clears throat> and it feels good and right in the moment, right? So there's different kinds of morality. So when I define morality, I'm talking about the optimal morality, which is this emotional presence and attunement with others, and this broader sense of connection to the world, to the community, and it's an open, flexible attunement. So it's really very right hemisphere kind of dominated rather than left hemisphere dominated, which is more of categorizing and exclusion, exclusion to towards things that are different. And, you know, so it's um, it has to do with that orientation you have in the moment, what perceptions what that that you have when you're in that self-protective mode, your perception narrows. You're just all about self-protection and you know what can I do to feel safer. Whereas if you're in that relational mode, you're open and you you have a broader sense of of the world and you're more attuned to more things, right? So what perceptions do you have? What skills have you developed for being with others? And this happens starting in early life. How well you're nurtured is going to build all those pre-verbal social skills uh, in our evolved context, the evolved nest we'll talk about. You are learning how to get along with a whole bunch of different people in micro uh, skill ways, so many layers of them, right? And so you bring to the moment in your morality all those skills, the perception, the automaticities then that you develop from those early years and anything you've been practicing a lot becomes automatic after a while. And when you make a decision then, how wide is your scope of inclusion? How empathically connected and concerned are you for how many lives around you? Is it the web of life or just you? <laughs> or just you and your family, right? So my morality, the, the optimal in my view, is the broader uh, contextual uh, very knowledgeable know-how about how to get along and how to enhance the well-being of others. So it's really <laughs> very big. So ultimately, it's about compassionate communal imagination uh, and orientation to the well-being of all our relations. 
Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the concept that you mentioned in your answer, the evolved nest. What is it about? So every animal has a nest and or a, a developmental system for raising the young. And we do too as human beings. And we are social mammals. So our nest resembles very much the social mammalian nest with some slight changes. Social mammals emerged at least 20 million, if not 40 million years ago, and they evolved to have a very intensive parenting or uh, developmental system for the young. And that includes then soothing perinatal experiences. So not stressed out moms, uh, pregnant moms, or a stressed out birth, no separation of the baby from mom. That, that imprints the brain in the wrong direction no painful procedures, uh, for example, no inducement of, of uh, labor, and all the things we do now to interfere that undermine uh, the development of the child and the connection and bonding of the mom and child. Then there's breastfeeding. Uh, it's usually a shocker to hear that, well, I should tell you first, where do we get these ideas of what our nest is? And that is from the nomadic foraging communities all over the world have these common practices. And what are they, why them? Well, they represent 99% of our history as a human genus, uh, or you could say species, the, um, the recent uh, Homo sapiens. So uh, these are characteristics then that are assumed to have uh, just um, matched up with the maturational schedule of the child to enhance normal development. And that's what other nests do for other animals and ours too. So it's uh, soothing perinatal experiences, it's breastfeeding, and this is uh, on request by the child. So immediately after birth, if, if allowed, the baby will, in natural birth, the baby will crawl up the mother's belly and uh, uh, squeeze the nipple and get the milk going. It's like, oh my God, talk about self-efficacy from the day, you know, first hour of life, whoo, right? So, uh, and then that, bonds the mom to the baby and all the reward systems of their bodies are ready to <clears throat> magnetically connect in those first that first hour in particular and the breastfeeding then is designed to be tailored to the baby's needs at the time whether a boy or a girl whether they're in a growth spurt or not whether there's infection in the region or not the mom's mom's milk will produce an antibody for whatever is around and um <clears throat> So for, for it to be successful, the mom has to keep feeding the baby and suckling even without nourishment to comfort the baby. This is what happens in our ancestral environment. Lots, anytime the, the baby, young baby gets distressed, immediately goes to a breast, maybe mom's, maybe someone else's breast, maybe even a male's breast, dad's breast, or someone else in the community, because that comforts the child. And the length uh, is always a shocker, uh, so on average, our species uh, like provides breast milk till, on average, age four. Now, why? Oh, my God. Really? Yeah. Poof, everyone's mind's exploding. Uh, why is that? Well, it's because the immune system takes at least that long to develop fully to, to human uh, adult capacities. And the mom's milk is providing all the immunoglobulins to build that immune system plus the building blocks of a good, well-functioning brain and body, you know, thousands of ingredients. We hardly understand breast milk because it's, it's kind of like a magical elixir. Uh, so, all right, that's breast milk. Um, so average age of weaning is four. That means some people breastfeed longer in some communities around the world, uh, traditionally. So then there's uh, responsiveness. So babies are born, they resemble fetuses until they're 18 months of age. That means because their brains otherwise get too big and they can't get out of the mom's birth canal, right? So they have to finish growing their brain outside the womb. And a lot of that happens in those first 18 months. And so they really need an external womb experience. A womb with a view is how Ashley Montague <laughs> named it. So that means you're carrying the baby around all the time. So, um, and part of that is to make sure they stay in a calm state while their brain is growing so fast. So the biochemistry is pro-growth. If you stress that baby, leaving them to cry, leaving them alone, 
the cortisol levels will increase, for example, and that actually melts those connections of the brain that are supposed to be growing. Think the wrong things will get enhanced. The survival systems, fear, rage, all the emotion systems we share with other mammals. And the things that are supposed to be growing, all these pro-social sub, uh, subconscious skills to get along with others, aren't going to have their uh, day and the sensitive period will pass. <clears throat> all right, so then there's uh, touch. As I mentioned, the baby needs that womb with a view. So they expect to be carried around and on someone's body or in someone's arms for as long as they want. And in our ancestral context, that's what happens. Everyone's carrying the baby. No matter how much else they're carrying on their head or in their body, or whatever they're doing, the baby's never put down because they have a sense they knew somehow that if they did that, there would be bad outcomes later. And that's what we see in our um, unnested societies today. Then there's also alloparents. So a lot of this is like, oh my God, putting all this on moms? Oh, no, no, that's not our ancestral context either. It's a village Allo parenting, allo mothers, other mothers were also available to hold and carry the child, to suckle the child, to uh, carry the child, whatever it is. Uh, so it was, and these are responsive caregivers, right? The baby quickly learns who's not responsive and doesn't want to be with them, right? And you can tell today when a baby starts crying when they're put in someone's arms, oops, not a good relationship there, don't make it happen, right? So then there's a welcoming climate of support for the baby, if they feel like they belong, the mother feels supported in having the child and, and nurturing and provisioning the child. Play, self-directed, free play in the natural world with multiple age playmates, that's our heritage as well throughout childhood. Builds the brain in all sorts of ways. Uh, helps uh, build um, social skills, the ability to stop and start actions, control aggression, uh, and works out any emotional issues you have when you play it out. We can do, use that as therapy in our families today. Then there's, as I mentioned, nature immersion and connection and attachment to the natural world where you are. Really fundamental, I think, for being an ethical earthling. Uh, all these things that we know now from neuroscience are important for shaping the brain to function optimally, which normally optimally, right, is like you don't get all stressed out and then can't think very well. That's not optimal, <laughs> right? You're able to calm yourself down quickly. That's what baby learns when they're nested well. If you leave babies to cry or isolate them or spank them or punish them in some way, they're not going to learn the things they're supposed to be learning. They're going to learn to shut themselves down and they'll have some big deep hole in their heart. They, they know something's missing if you've left them alone when they're uh, when they start to develop that sense of self and other, um, there's different degrees of it, but in around age three, there's really a, a significant shift. And in our ancestral context, they're still being breastfed. They're still co-sleeping. They're still, they're playing with the play group. They start to enter the play group and they feel connected to the nature. So they don't have this big break in our, in our uh, civilized cultures. They're not breastfed very long, and so when that self-awareness comes, it's like, oh my God, I'm alone. <laughs> you know, it's the, <laughs> this deep sense of insecurity, and they they then uh, have to find ways to fill it, and then it leads to all sorts of addictive and, and obsessive kinds of behaviors that even us professors have. You know, <laughs> anxiety. <laughs> we got to learn more. You know, for us, you don't feel okay. Uh, so there's a million ways to to be uh, pathological in a way. Yeah, so since you take evolution into account, does it have something to do with morality having innate aspects to it, human morality in this case? And I mean, uh, I also wanted to ask you if there are innate aspects to morality, to morality what is innate what does innate mean in this context? Because uh, I've already asked several times uh, social scientists if there are innate aspects to human behavior and sometimes they give me different definitions and some of them even say that they don't use the word innate at all because it's confusing. So what is your take on that? Okay, there's sort of two questions there. First, yeah. uh, I would say in our ancestral context, uh, survival 
dependent on growing virtue of getting along with others, of being concerned for others, of knowing how to fit in, how to fit in with the human community and the other than human community. And if you were cooperative, you're gonna not have the, the support or um, intelligence uh, to survive. And in just like in the civilized world before 1850, in our ancestral context, there is a 50% or so mortality rate before age 15 which means that the people who weren't as smart, weren't as cooperative, didn't la or unlucky, of course, uh, didn't last, didn't make it to adulthood. And I think, um, so I, I see virtue and survival going together in the non-civilized world. Now in the civilized world, we've, we've separated them and we keep everyone alive, no matter how aggressive they are, <laughs> dysfunctional, pathological, because we have food everywhere, for example. All right, then how about the innate aspects? Well, in my, it, it, people are finding out more and more scientists how cooperative the natural world is. And I think cooperation and mutualism are just inherent in, in nature. So you, more research coming out about <clears throat> how um, bird song uh, opens the stomata of leaves and trees so that they, they grow better to receive a, a, a produce uh, or coordinate their chemistry for growing. Um, but, you know, mother trees and forests feed the young of other species even. Uh, and all the rhizomes and all the things in soil that are keeping everything alive on the planet, essentially. So cooperation is the, the big cake of what nature is. And we, but we tend to focus on competition for various reasons, in part, I think, because we've been raised to be oriented to domination uh, and and we didn't get our needs met as a child and so we had to fight for them and we feel like everything's scarce and there's not enough. <sighs> and so you're focused in on how, how that works. And so the uh, competition, I think, is more of a thin frosting on this huge cake of cooperation. So I think we're inherently cooperative. Our microbiome, 99%, up to 90 to 99% of our genes in our, each of our bodies is not human that we're carrying. It's the microbiome. Talk about cooperation and community, right? What does that mean about selfish genes? And I'm com competing with you? I mean, is it my microbiome competing with yours? I mean, who knows? It's so complicated. Um, but we have to understand that even our brain cells communications are, there's a cooperation going on everywhere and so complex. And what we find out then is when the nest is not provided, when these different pieces of it that different people study, things don't get regulated very well. The cooperation becomes uncooperation in a way. So you get easily thrown off kilter and, and you can't get back in balance very easily because your systems weren't set up properly. So there's a certain kind of cooperation that's needed from the prior generations to the new generations, the babies, right? They have to be uh, well nested for them to grow up well. Uh, and then the ones, the parents and the caregivers have to be uh, nested themselves by the elders and the wisdom of the culture to be able to give the right proper attention and, and support for that. And they all are giving support to that baby. So uh, cooperation's everywhere. If we're gonna be virtuous, if we're gonna be moral, uh, if you wanna be vicious uh, and non-moral, uh, amoral, people say, I think uh, there's not a lot of that. I think I'm more of a, <clears throat> it's either morality or not. Then you don't provide all these things and you, you uh, put babies and people into stressful situations and then we shouldn't be surprised that a lot of immoral behavior, or dysregulated behavior, which looks like bad character, but it's actually this dysregulation at some point in the neurobiology of the person uh, and the lack of skill development and all the things I mentioned earlier. So I think we're innately prepared to be loving, but we have to be loved into our, our normal species typical unfolding. Mm -hmm. In your work, do you take into account moral foundations theory? I mean, I'm asking you because nowadays in social science, when we talk about morality, 
it always comes to the table. Uh, I mean, what people think about moral foundations theory. And by the way, just before you answer, just to tell the audience that the moral foundations are uh, care slash arm, fairness, uh, loyalty, authority, sanctity slash purity and liberty. Yeah, so I have uh, written about moral foundations theory and compared it to our work. And um, so I know it's out there, it's popular, it's easy to study, <laughs> you find something to publish, and the, you know, uh, but I think it's mostly a study of civilization's morality. So it's not our human nature, but people are misinterpreting it as our human nature. Um, so I think uh, civilization has misdeveloped our humanity and our morality. So uh, that means that the, well, the harm and fairness, I think, underlies all of them. <laughs> but you can spell it out and, and uh, some of the questions really are oriented to pulling out conservatism, so-called. Uh, Purity, for example, everyone's worried about that to some degree. You know, you want clean food, clean water, clean air, right? But they don't ask those kinds of questions. So there's the methodological critique. But even so, uh, I think the the orientation to purity in group and hierarchy you don't see that in our ancestral context. Uh, that comes about from civilization, in my view. It comes about from coercion, from punishing children, uh, from urging them to distrust others and that again that pre-verbal sense of distrust because you didn't get your needs met well you know you're you're in this mode pretty much automatically and you don't know why and so you look for a rationale for that feeling right and so i think a lot of our morality and civilization is trying to rationalize those feelings we have uh which would be um in group and purity in hierarchy, you have to punish people into that. It's just not part of our nature. Uh, unless, so what, what that does is actually pushes us into our primate nature, our subhuman, our pre-human nature. Primates are hierarchical, but humans aren't. The uh, Christopher Baum and others have shown. We develop to be fiercely egalitarian and keep those egos in play, in place, right? So, so you don't want someone's ego getting out of line the big hunter, you know, and, and so the, in, in the reports by Richard Lee and other anthropologists, the community will, you know, have rules about the big hunter getting a big animal or they'll the have some uh, procedures for dealing with that. For example, uh, the other hunters will say, oh, it's so tiny. Maybe we should go back and get a rabbit. It would be bigger, you know, and, and they tease and tease and tease until that, that, you know, hunter from the ego puffing up starts to laugh, you know, it gets back down here with everyone else. So it's really important to control, uh, to find ways to control the ego, because we all have that, that ego that wants to pop up and feel superior. And once that happens, all sorts of bad things can happen. That person, and, they, and then when they've asked these uh, fellow hunters, why do you do that? They say, oh, he could become dangerous. And we see it all over the world now, all these dangerous big egos, right? They control, grab all the, the resources, hoard everything for themselves, uh, uh, become cruel towards others because they think they, you know, better than everyone else. So I think that's civilization. So uh, moral foundations theory is looking at civilization, not at human nature. Because in our ancestral context, they're oriented to cooperation, to building social joy and connection. Uh, and they're able to take multiple perspectives, even with the animals. Uh, and that's just normal. <laughs> and they welcome otherness. They, they are in it. They, they're okay with ambiguity. And civilization pushes us into this scary place and we got to have everything, you know, clear and scripted or else uh, we don't feel safe. And that's encouraged because the, the people, the elites can control us then with fear, right? Oh, look, they're going to come and get you those evil green people, whatever it is. <laughs> so that's one critique. Another critique is that intuitions, yes, intuitions guide us, but they have to be well educated uh, because intuitions, we don't educate our intuitions very well. You watch movies and TV and you, you learn to feel the world is dangerous and everyone's out to get me. Paranoia is increased. That's not a good intuition for, our, it's not human nature to have been that way. Now, of course you say, well, 
but our society is not very safe. Well, yeah, but you're creating it with the cultures, pushing it on to us, undermining early care. And then, yeah, everything's just, it's a spiral. I call it the, the cycle of competitive detachment. Under care for children, you develop a neurobiology that doesn't function very well. When you're an adult, you're, you're kind of ill, sickly. U.S. has the worst health outcomes of the world, <laughs> of the advanced world for sure. Uh, and then your morality is very self-centered because you're just, <clears throat> and you build a culture to go with it and it keeps spiraling down. And that's where the U.S. is right now in my view. So what, what uh, the Moral Foundations Theory misses then is development. It misses the development of intuitions. It misses baselines for what's a species typical. Nah, <laughs> they just assume, oh yeah, civilization, that's species typical. Uh -uh. <laughs> so you have to have, and we'll talk about it later, I think, a transdisciplinary perspective. You have to take into account all the kinds of disciplines that have looked at human humanity. Mm -hmm. Right. And how do children develop morality? Is it that moral development goes through different stages? Like, for example, a few decades ago, people like Piaget and Kohlberg and others proposed stages to moral development. But is that really how things work? Yeah, so I was a neo-Kohlbergian uh, in my graduate work. And uh, the uh, work, I worked with James Rust, who I married, he's passed away, uh, and he developed a de defining issues test of moral reasoning or moral judgment. And uh, Piaget was oriented to how the implicit intuitive uh, sensibilities move into an explicit verbalizable understanding, right? So that's what he was studying. Uh, and. Jim Rust and the Defining Issues Test focuses on that intuitive, tacit knowledge uh, because that's a lot of people don't know how to explain their morality, don't know how to put it into words, right? So this was trying to give them a way to express. So it's, it's useful. Um, but that's reasoning. So they were, uh, Piaget, Kohlberg, Rust were focused mostly on reasoning or judgment, which is, again, that's uh, it's the semantic conscious, usually conscious mind what you've learned to, to, uh, uh, through words, through school, through what people your parents have told you, right? So that's different than the kind of morality I was talking about earlier, right? It's this more embodied morality. And for, for that, you need the nest, you need support, you need good experiences to build the right intuition. So not playing violent video games, that's building the wrong intuitions, enhancing the old parts of the brain threat reactive, you know, see threat everywhere. So you've got to immerse the child in the right kinds of experiences, allow them the freedom to learn in those environments, and they will develop virtue. So I think as a matter of course, in our ancestral context, you've got the nest, you've got stories that are told by the elders and acted out, and you've got dancing and singing together around the fire, uh, you have an immersion experience with the natural world and you feel connected to everyone. You feel safe. You feel like you're uh, competent to live in that place with everyone and in that natural world. That's how children should develop their morality. Now, what we do is we undermine everything and then we tell them to read a book and be moral like this. Or I'm going to spank you, right? And you coerce them into some behavior you want, but they don't have it deep down. It's not embodied. It's this semantic knowledge, and then they feel already empty, and, and then the, the superego thing, you know, Freud. <laughs> That's the <laughs> culture for a, a civilized person who hasn't gotten the bottom-up way of, of, of nestedness, of growing their morality. So uh, I think we've lost the boat there. Now, there, if you're going to study civilized people again, uh, and they tend to, you know, gravitate towards words and conscious mind. And so that that's what people tend to tend to study. And then you get to, but then they're hypocritical. They'll say, Oh, I do this. Uh, this is what I think is the best thing to do. And then you put them in a situation. They don't do that. It's because it's not in their body. It's not following their intuitions and their, and maybe they don't even know what their intuitions are because they've never had the experience. And then they just fall back on some other pattern that they've learned. So it's 
kind of all messed up. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm kind of negative here today, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So um, another question. Do parents play an important role in moral development? Because I'm asking you this because in behavioral genetics, we know that for most psychological traits, or at least the ones that people have studied, um, the shared environment doesn't play that big of a role and it's more the non-shared environment and genetic factors. So does that also happen in terms of moral development? Well, I was told by my, one of my expert statistician colleagues who studies twin studies in genetics to not trust twin studies, uh, except maybe in the last few years. So all those studies showing... Um, differences between uh, twins raised in uh, uh, fraternal and, and uh, monozygotic twins and raised in and out of the same home or whatever, they're not reliable. Uh, so I'm very skeptical about all that. And I think uh, this kind of brings us to another question you had me think about ahead of time, and that's our inheritances. Um, and I think uh, we forget that genes are just one little tiny piece of what we inherit. And you know, we share 99.9999% of our genes with one another. Very little changes from, uh, from generation to generation. Some tiny little piece. Again, that's that focus on competition, which is this little tiny thing. But look at all the stuff we conserve, uh, generation to generation, to, including the evolved nest, right? Except our culture has then trumped biology and and said oh it's not important you just have to think to be moral you know or you just make decisions in your head it doesn't matter what we do to your body <laughs> it's crazy uh and so there's a miss uh, of course that's that disconnect from the body that we force children into because we shut them down if they're not nested with love and affection and all so the genetic question then um I mean, there are going to be some genetic things that matter, but I think what's happened is we've pulled a rug out from children. We've not nested them at all. And so then what do you, what do you look at for what's different from all these poor children that are underdeveloped, misdeveloped? Uh, well, you find genes that are different. Yeah, but that's because you didn't give them the nest. If you provide the nest, it buffers all sorts of uh, trauma, buffers. That's what we have some papers that are... Uh, under review showing that the uh, adverse child experiences are buffered by having more of the nest experiences in, in physiological regulation in adulthood. Uh, and so we, we're just misdirecting our attention, which I think is a really important aspect of being a moral person. Where do you put your attention? And there's a lot of other things I could, you want me to keep going about the inheritances? Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to bring the question back to my original question, let's say, yeah. where I asked if parents play a big role in children's moral development. Yes. So, well, in our ancestral context, it would be the whole community, right? And it, mm -hmm. so it's a shared nesting of the child in our civilized community where we isolate children with one parent or two then the parents are going to have some effect, but it's not the optimal effect. Uh, and in terms of genes or not, uh, the epigenetics I think is much more important. So what that child experiences at particular times, sensitive periods is gonna turn on, figuratively speaking, turn on or turn off genes that are gonna then, it stays with that child for the rest of their life. For, so for example, the rat studies, um, which have been now shown to have some effect in, in humans too. In the first 10 days of life, if you're a rat and you have a high nurturing mother, that means she licks you a lot, <laughs> Michael Meany's work. I asked him about this and I said, well, what does that mean for humans? He said, oh, it's holding. So first six months of life, a lot of caring and holding would be the equivalent of a high nurturing. Uh, if you have that kind of a mother, the genes to control anxiety and lots of genes actually, but they, the, uh, they said hundreds of genes are affected. But the, this one that they focused on will turn on uh, controls for anxiety. So you have ability the rest of your life to control anxiety when it occurs. 
If you have a low nurturing mother, you don't get licked enough, you don't get carried enough, the genes never get turned on properly, and the rest of your life you have anxiety. And the only way to cure it is to take drugs. So here we are in the United States, there's not a lot of uh, touch and carrying of babies. They're pushed around usually or driven around or put in carriers or whatever it is, that's not the same thing. So we're, we have epidemics of anxiety and depression at all ages. Uh, it's not a surprise if you know the neurobiological construction of it. So mm -hmm. parents then are epigenetically shaping their child for life, which for me, the neurobiology matters for how you're going to act. Because if you don't feel very well, I mean, if you're, you know, your vagus nerve isn't working very well, your stress response is out of your sugar, your glucose uh, uptake and the insulin, everything is not well constructed because of poor early care, you're not going to want to be open and compassionate and open-minded. You're going to be irritable. <laughs> you know, just don't bother me and do what I want. And, you know, something simple and, and black and white, that's what you're going to be oriented to. So the parent uh, effects are critical, but it shouldn't be just parents. It should be the village. And the parents' own experience of, of trauma, uh, famine, uh, Holocaust experience, can be transmitted to the next generation or even the next generation after that. So if your grandparents went through a famine, you as a uh, grandchild can have a survival phenotype. Your body can be, uh, has been signaled to be ready to fight for life, you know, and so you have to work at getting food. And then when you come out, <clears throat> so your liver's more compact, your heart's more compact, for example. And then when you arrive, the food's everywhere and you start, your body isn't set up for that. And so you, be, you have all these diseases of Western civilization, heart disease, obesity, diabetes. So there's a way for then for intergenerational transmission, but there's also the way for actual treatment of that child that affects the genes. Uh, and then for me, it bubbles up to morality, it bubbles up how to how social you are, how moral you are, what kind of morality you have. There are different kinds. So you're going to have the self-protective morality instead of a compassionate. Mm -hmm. So uh, since you mentioned epigenetics, I mean, I had this question here reserved for later, but perhaps I will introduce it now. Uh, you've also mentioned other aspects that I'm going to talk about now, but in the book you talk about multiple inheritances that shape humanity, and you mentioned genes, epigenetics, developmental plasticity, the microbiome, local and macroecological heritages, uh, and others. So why do you call them inheritances, and how do you look at how they interact with one another? Well, I don't look at the interactions. I look at what the experts in these areas uh, tell us and then try to think about what the interactions are. So okay. I'm reliant on all these experts in these areas. So uh, as Lynn Margulis pointed out, uh, cell plans and body plans are not transmitted via genes. Uh, and actually genes, people don't even know what they are anymore. There's like 15 different definitions and it's just all really so complicated. Uh, epigenetics, I mentioned already, and uh, developmental plasticity, we're even more plastic than our cousins chimpanzees uh, to learn from our early experience, in part because we're so immature, we're more immature at birth than other, other apes, and our basic needs are really huge. Uh, Maslow is the most famous uh, scholar associated with that term, basic needs. Uh, and he pointed out, you know, at least uh, the way people describe it, his theory is that it's a hierarchy, but it really isn't a hierarchy for a baby. The baby is self-actualizing from how they're being treated, and they need shelter and safety and love and esteem and a sense of belonging, and they need, um, you know, food and all the basic phys physical things, but they need the social supports, and they need to feel like they're safe to grow. So basic needs are just built into us, and if they're not met, especially in early life, but throughout life, we're just not going to be very well functioning. We're going to be more self-protective. We'll get into our stress mode and then, you know, kind of shut in or we'll get angry and try to control things out there. And I mentioned the microbiome that's affected by the mom's diet in pregnancy, by the mom's diet during pre uh, breastfeeding, and by the early experience. They've even shown that 
Babies who are born by C-section tend to have the bacteria from the operating room in their biome, microbiome, which is, <gasps> thanks. Uh, and then the maternal's uh, ecology, how well that mom's body has been developed from her own experiences and her grandparents' experiences are going to shape how well that baby's needs are, are fed in the womb. And then the local ecology, what is the world like where you live? The How, um, how much wildness? How much diversity is there? And the culture that you're born into, is it a harsh culture? Is it a loving culture? What kind of uh, supports do they provide for families? The uh, Yuri Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory talks about layers and layers of supports and interconnections for that child's development. Uh, and the moral sense is something that, the, so I'm reading through my list here. <laughs> Another inheritance <laughs> is the moral sense. Darwin thought it was innate, so he pointed out social pleasure that, uh, and he saw these other uh, characteristics in other animals and said they come, they accumulate in humans. So, so uh, having pleasure, being with others, uh, empathy, uh, being concerned for the opinion of others, that kind of thing. And in one of my papers, I point out that these things don't seem to be innate because in the U.S. they're all diminishing over the last few uh, decades, especially, where people don't really enjoy being with one another, although the pandemic maybe is gonna change that. <laughs> but uh, the single adult ha households are have been increasing extensively. It's a majority of households, apparently. And um, there's a lot of uh, lower empathy in college students uh, significantly, and the uh, ability to get along and, and actually build habits to get along are uh, seems to be diminishing. That's something that's affected by early experience, especially in boys. They don't learn habits very well if they're under under cared for. So I think uh, that's another one that's maybe we're prepared to be immorally have the moral sense, but we have to have the right experiences, like many of these things. And then self-organization. Every living creature self-organizes around experience. And so if you you're uh, under cared for in early life, you're going to organize around trying to stay alive in that circumstance or in a violent home, you're gonna self-organize around being aggressive or whatever it takes because life wants to live, right? The life force is very strong and you adapt to the particular circumstance, but that's not evolutionary adaptation. It doesn't mean you're gonna be better off than your rival with a good nurturing background over generations. No, your, your genes aren't gonna do as well because they're, they've already, the trajectory has been diminished. So people don't, seems to mix up these things, right, about what's adaptive in a particular life and uh, whether it's evolutionarily adaptive and it's functionally adaptive, but not evolutionary. So I don't know if I've answered your question well enough, but... Uh, well, I mean, I think that you haven't answered my first question where I asked you why do you call all of these, uh, let's say, aspects inheritances? Uh, well... I think the focus usually is on the genes that we inherit genes. Yeah. Uh, and other scholars have said, no, it's much more than that. And so I just expanded the list from what other people have said in anthropology and uh, evolutionary sciences. And these are the things that then they all come together in this list. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, another question. What is a moral self? And how does it develop? Well, the moral self, I think, has uh, becomes important for a civilized creature because of that detachment from the connected self, right? So we have in civilization, we, especially in the Western civilization, don't feel connected to the natural world, to other people in the way that our ancestral context um, per, um, supported, and you have that hole in yourself, and so you have to figure out who you are. You're, it's forced on you. <laughs> who am I? Your identity. Uh, and in our ancestral context, you don't really have to think about it. You're just part of the group, you know, and it's so much fun. And, you know, yeah, there's hard things, but it's not that bad because you're together. <laughs> but now we have all this isolation and... Um, the sense of scarcity and competition, and, and so you have to have the, some kind of moral, moral self uh, to survive, right? It could be an, 
a moral self of being a tough guy, right? So there's different kinds of morality. As I said, there's the protected self, uh, self-protectionism, so that you're always either trying to be dominant, or if that person's really big, you go into the, the kind of withdrawal mode in face-to-face situations. But you can also use your abstract thinking to <clears throat> build from those feelings. So if you're a very aggressive kind of, that's the way you, you roll in your life, you'll use your abstract thinking to plan viciousness to plan dominance to plan revenge whatever that is right or if you're a timid person because your your parents left you to cry and cry and cry until you could barely breathe anymore and you had to stay alive and so you learned to just shut down your morality is going to be about you know just give me the right answer you know and that kind of thing uh feeling uh, you know, uh, latch on to ideologies that tell you that you're safe and you're better than those other people and things like that. But ideally, your morality comes out of that sense of connection. And when you have the sense of connection face to face and the rela- uh, relational attunement, you use your imagination then for more enhancement of relationships and you have a broader and indigenous perspective. You include the other than human. So the moral self depends. <laughs> Uh, there's this conscious kind of moral self people are studying, you know, well, purpose and things like that in the civilized world. Um, and uh, for me, it's we're a shadow of ourselves. Civilized people are a shadow of our true selves. Mm. Uh, and um, are social interactions essential when it comes to our moral development? I mean, if we didn't have any social interactions would would we be able to develop morally no that that sounds like a philosophical uh <laughs> question the baby on the deserted island what will they be like <laughs> yeah there's no baby without a mother right they would they wouldn't exist they wouldn't live <laughs> so uh it's always social we're always in a dyad from the conception we are already in relationship so everything, we're related. Even if we're not aware of it, we are related to the trees around us. We are related to the river nearby. We are related <laughs> to the animals that we meet or the, the animals we don't see. It's like everything's relationship. Now, what, what's important for a child's development is to pay, uh, draw their attention to those relationships. Initially, it should just be the keeping that baby happy uh, and so they can grow and, and non-verbally learn all that connection. And then when they start to uh, uh, better able to follow stories and things like that, which takes us some years, <clears throat> you tell them the stories over and over about how they're related to their ancestors, how they're related to the fox, how they're related to the wolf or the bear, whatever it is in the local community, in the local landscape. And they learn about you know, how to put words to things that they sense intuitively. So um, I think, again, for to be a good earthling, you need to have a sense of relationships to everything, a sense of relation. Mm -hmm. And what is human flourishing and does it have something to do with morality? I think it does. So uh, if you don't, like I've said, if you don't feel well, if you've got dysregulated systems, you're just not going to be as morally oriented in the compassionate way as I uh, have described. And what we see in uh, John Young and his group, eightshields.org, have listed, have talked about, uh, he's written for me in my book, uh, Indigenous Wisdom, uh, edited book with others, uh, written about what a thriving adult looks like in the communities, the San Bushmen. The San Bushmen have been around for 100,000 years at least their, their culture. And what they look like are, are things like this. They have a quiet mind. They're able to be emotionally present and attentive. They have childlike glee. Uh, they're vital, the abundance of energy. They're fully alive. They have high autonomy. They follow their impulses, which are well constructed. <laughs> they're honest and truthful. They have a good sense of humor, mostly about human foibles. Uh, they build habits easily, they have outstanding perceptions, uh, memory, they have know-how for getting along in their particular landscape, they feel ecologically attached, and, you know, why would you cut that tree down? It's 
part of the community kind of thing, uh, and a connection to spirit, so things beyond the manifest, so an awareness of reality beyond what you can see, uh, which includes the ancestors. And then their relationships are uh, characterized by lots of enjoyment with one another and trying to you know, enhance that experience with jokes and play and song. Uh, they're very cooperative, smoothly so. You don't even, you feel so welcomed there. <coughs> um, because they're so cooperative, as uh, described by anthropologists, you can feel this more in uh, collectivist societies. Well, I visited, I always feel like a, sort of like a marshmallow uh, community. Versus in the States, it's more like ping pong balls. People are bouncing off each other. You don't feel that uh, connected. Uh, they also have lots of empathy, unconditionally listen to others, uh, so you always have confidence. Communally oriented, very helpful, unconditionally loving and forgiving and generous, egalitarian, and having a sense of responsibility towards the web of life. So these are things that I think show thriving, and that's what we should be aiming for, and we know now how, how to get there when we provide that nest and then the support systems throughout life. Mm -hmm. But these lessons we can learn from indigenous societies, can we really apply them in a modern uh, context? I mean, in a modern, developed, industrialized society? Well, I think uh, European societies are doing better than the United States, where they provide uh, for, for example, Switzerland has a law that any child care center has to be built next to a retirement community so that the old elders are right there with the young children beautiful because they are motivated to be with the little kids and the kids love to be right so that's you know tuning in i think we have to understand what our heritage are which are even this list of thriving aspects and then how do we build our societies around providing for those so i think that's where the, the work has to be done uh, in the United States, we sort of have been going backwards in so many ways in terms of child support and family support. So there's a lot to be done. Uh, parental leave um, so that moms and babies and dads and babies can bond together in that first year especially. Uh, and then <clears throat> having babies at work uh, so that the mom can go and breastfeed when needed. And I mean, the society has to be shifted back, which it used to be. Just as industrialization has shifted us, uh, put the workplace outside the home, um, but back to bringing the families and work together so moms can fulfill their, their capacities, their gifts, uh, at the same time as being mothers. Right now in the States, it's just terrible for moms having to do everything at home. Homeschool their children, shelter, right there, everyone's sheltering in place, work on the computer and go to meetings, and then uh, <clears throat> care give their elders and then, you know, make meals and all the other things. It's like, ah, <laughs> it's not the right way, right? We have to get back to supporting extended families living together. U.S. has moved away from that, for example, making laws against multifamily housing and things like that. So we have to just become aware. And I think part of my work is to make people aware it doesn't have to be this way, the way we're living. Mm -hmm. So, one final question. How do you go about doing research that uh, happens at the intersection of many different disciplines like anthropology, neurobiology, uh, developmental psychology, educational psychology and others? Is it easy? Is it hard? How do you do it? Well, it's, it's uh, hard, but I feel driven. You know, you have a muse that tells you what you need to do. And, you know, if you don't do it, you get, I get sick. <laughs> so, all right, <laughs> oh, <laughs> got to go read that. Okay. Um, so my field is moral development, and that's already interdisciplinary, right? Because it integrates philosophy, psychology, education, and um, development generally. But I think it also includes, and that's what I try to encourage my colleagues to also include, anthropology, ethology, uh, sociology, history, and neurobiology. Uh, so what I do is I read widely and I find the interactions and the kind of bits of information and try to piece them together, you know. Uh, the, because one discipline will look at some questions and have some hints of answers and another one will have some others but they haven't been brought together so i try to always bring together 
It's difficult, though, because it's easy to step on toes if you're in someone else's discipline and you don't say it the right way because they've, you know, argued about this word for, like, generations or something, and you just use that word, oh, no, and then it triggers them to get mad at you. So I try to get um, assistance, editorial assistance from experts and say, did I say this the right way? <laughs> so you got to be, you know, bold, but also a little, you know, careful as you mm -hmm. go along. Yeah. Okay, so just before we go, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find your work? Yes, I think uh, probably the best place is evolvednest.org. And I think you'll have a link or something there. Uh, that's where we're putting all this information together. It's housed under kindredworld.org, uh, which also has this bigger picture of how the Society needs to change in order to support well-being, wellness, flourishing of human beings. So those are the places to go. I'm, I still have my university materials at the university website, University of Notre Dame. So if you Google my name and that, you'll find uh, academic papers as well. Google Scholar also. Yeah, I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Narvaez, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you so much, Ricardo. It's been a pleasure for me. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. My channel is now more than three years old, and to keep it sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, you can also find links to it in the description box of this interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Pereira Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan V. Selenian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassi, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Please, Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafinia, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardas France, and Nirvan Balachandran. And finally, my executive producers, Michel Ruzieski, Rosie, James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.